Tonight on The Readout. I think there's also a question about why Trump's lawyers apparently were so misleading, potentially lying in the affidavit saying they returned all the information. And I think, you know, there's a difference between playing a lawyer on TV and actually having good legal counsel. Ouch. Scathing remarks from Mike Pence's former chief of staff as those very lawyers now claim that Trump's stashing of highly classified documents at Mar-a-Lago is nothing more than a storage dispute. Plus, new reporting tonight from the New York Times on an escalation of the Justice Department's criminal probe of January 6th, including 40 new subpoenas. Also, she's the woman who defeated Sarah Palin in Alaska, giving hope that Democrats can hold on to their House majority. Mary Peltola, who takes her seat in Congress tomorrow, joins me tonight. We begin tonight on the 60th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's historic moonshot speech, announcing his goal of putting a man on the moon and bringing him home. Today, President Joe Biden announced new steps in his own moonshot vision, ending cancer as we know it, a cause he is truly passionate about since the passing of his son, Bo, from the disease. On the 60th anniversary of his clarion call, we face another inflection point. And together, we can choose to move forward with unity, hope, and optimism. And I believe we can usher in the same unwillingness to postpone, the same national purpose that will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills to end cancer as we know it and even cure cancers once and for all. And while Biden was busy presidenting, his predecessor surprised everyone today, returning to D.C., looking a bit disheveled, apparently, to play golf at his course in Virginia. The golfing field trip comes as Donald Trump's legal team is doubling down on their claims that the twice impeached, disgraced, apparent document thief has every right to the classified stash he held at Mar-a-Lago and opposing the Justice Department's request for continued access to those 100 or so classified documents seized during the FBI search so that they can continue their investigation. In a filing this morning, Trump's legal team, picking up Marco Rubio's talking points, called this whole situation simply a document storage dispute that has spiraled out of control, claiming the government is wrongfully seeking to criminalize the possession by the 45th president of his own presidential and personal records. Now, as we have told you repeatedly on this show, classified documents do not belong to any president and are, in fact, the property of the United States, especially when they relate to national security affairs. And for the rest, for the first time in any of their court filings, Trump's legal team is questioning whether the classified documents are even classified at all. They write the government's stance assumes that if a document is a classification marking, it remains classified, irrespective of any actions taken during President Trump's term in office, and that the government has not proven these records remain classified. That issue is to be determined later. They even have a, an entire section entitled, The President's Had the Power to Declassify Documents. But you know what's missing? Any actual assertion that Trump did, in fact, declassify anything. I mean, perhaps they have the legal smarts to know that there are criminal penalties if a lawyer lies to a court. And even if everything at Mar-a-Lago was declassified, which it wasn't, that would not change the potential violations of the three criminal statutes listed on the FBI search warrant. That is because, wait for it, not only are classified documents America's property, so are all of every president's records. They literally have to request them from the National Archives to put them in their own museums and libraries. So again, all of his theater by Trump and his lawyers is just another attempt to delay. But sure is looking like a looming indictment. And don't take my word for it. Listen to Ty Cobb who represented Trump during the investigation into the Russia scandal. What do you think the possibilities are of an indictment of former President Trump? I think they're very high. Having classified documents, particularly if you are actively using them, mm -hmm. could, be, uh, could be an offense well worthy of prosecution. Sure. Well worthy of prosecution. Joining me now is Charles Coleman, Jr., civil rights attorney, former prosecutor and MSNBC legal analyst, and Harry Lippman, former deputy assistant attorney general, L.A. Times legal columnist and host of the Talking Feds podcast. I'll go in reverse order and just ask you first, Harry Lippman, do you agree with Ty Cobb? 
Yeah, interestingly, um, he, Ty Cobb is saying that it's that it's, the indictment will likely go from emerge from January 6. We've been generally sort of separating them out, and people have been focusing on whether the documents themselves would lead to an indictment. But certainly, nothing he said uh, today. You put your finger right on the filing where he said, "Well." The government says they're classified, but how do we know that what that means? Of course, that's what it means to classify something the government says. Or I have this power to declassify, as you say. It screams the question, well, did you or didn't you? The judge is supposed to decide this by Thursday and has not as yet called for a hearing, which would be a pretty obvious step to do. So you can just ask the lawyers, who obviously do, as you say, want to avoid criminal liability. Well, did he or didn't he? Can you, how about, how about telling us? As of now, though, it's on the papers and he's um, disputed everything, making her, giving her no easy out. She's going to have to decide between two diametrically opposed positions. And since you served in, in, in Maine Justice, yeah. I just have to just clear, ask you to clarify for us one more time. I know we've said this over and over on the show, but I would love for you to clarify it. When a president's term ends, under the Presidential Records Act, who owns all their documents? Not just the classified ones, all of them. Yeah, even, even when he's there, look, he is Donald Trump, a former president. Another term for that is citizen. That's all he is. He has some access, as you said, with special kinds of procedures, which just show how wrong he is here to maybe send somebody and be able to take a picture of something. But it's so clear. Really, you, you've seen nobody uh, anywhere on any side of the aisle uh, dispute the proposition. These are not is. They belong to the country and the people. And that's even leaving aside the small set of very dangerous documents that he now is trifling with. You know, and Charles Coleman, the, the challenge here, except for Marco Rubio, who claims it's a storage issue, I don't know of any provision. And listen, I'm a lawyer. I haven't read the Presidential Records Act back to front. But I doubt that it says that presidents are allowed to store their records either at the National Archives or at their house. Right. I, I doubt that there is anything in the law that says you could store them at the White House and leave them in the National Archives or you could take them, I don't know, to Bedminster. Like th that isn't a thing. And so I feel like there isn't an argument here. Donald Trump did not have the right to have those records, period. And now we have. And look, we don't know what was in the boxes, but it's not like Trump only goes to Mar-a-Lago. You know, there is this Daily Mail video of him heading off to Bedminster with boxes. We don't know what was in the boxes. We can't say there's anything in there, classified documents or presidential records, but he moves around to different places. Today, he's in D.C. in his golf shoes. This guy could go anywhere. And the government, for more than a year, for 18 months, did not have access to the property of the federal government because he took things and hid them. I fail right. to understand how that is not just an open and obvious crime, putting aside what he did when it came to January 6th. Well, Joy, I think you're absolutely right. There is not an exception for any of this in the Presidential Records Act, which I have read from front to back, and it doesn't exist. The Trump uh, jury team, or the Trump legal team, rather, is trying to invent in an argument when one does not exist. And that's creative lawyering, and that's being kind in terms of how I'm describing it at best, because you do not have a legal pathway to excuse what we have seen here. Donald Trump has broken the law with the possession of these documents, full stop, period. I think it's important to understand, however, that even if there was a question or a dispute as to his ability to have these documents, the timeline makes very clear that he was in violation of these things and had been informed that he was in violation of these things. And he never, during the course of the back and forth between the National Archives, as well as between the Department of Justice, prior to the execution of the search warrant, made the argument that either these documents had been declassified or that he had considered these documents his personal property. So because of that, to now come with that sort of argument in front of the judge is not only disingenuous, but it just flies of not having any sort of logic, reason, or base in law or fact. And, and you know, except for in front of this judge. Uh, apparently, this is the one judge in, in the country who thinks, hey, you know, maybe there is. Uh, you know, uh, Harry, let me, I, I, uh, let's go to the other thing, because, right, Ty Cobb is sort of blending. And it's sort of, there's so many crimes, potential crimes, I should say, that it's hard to keep track of everything. But January 6th remains extent, right? You do have lots of people, very high level people in things like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers who are charged with seditious conspiracy, very important, very difficult crimes. So subpoenaing 40 different Trump allies 
seems like a pretty significant step for a Justice Department that had been accused by some and even some annoyed people uh, on the uh, January 6th commission of moving really slowly. This does not feel like moving really slowly. Yeah, I think that accusation has been put to bed. It's not just 40, it's who the 40 are. So they include just a lot of low-level people who were around Trump. Their only value to the government, but it's a huge value, is to be able to say, here's what he did, here's what he said. And by the way, these are not the sort of people who could ever claim attorney-client privilege. They're not attorneys or even executive privilege. They're really just, you know, there to, to kind of serve the king, but they have eyes, they have ears, and that makes them very potent witnesses against him. And this question, tell us about what, what he did and what he said on January 6th itself. From a small Yupik fishing village on the Kuskokwim River, five terms as a state legislator from Bethel, eight years as chair of the bipartisan Bush Caucus for rural legislators, proud Coast Guard mom, leader of the Kuskokwim River Intertribal Fish Commission, working to protect Alaska salmon. I'm the Democratic woman who can win. That right there is Mary Peltola, and tomorrow she will be sworn in as Alaska's first Democratic House member in nearly 50 years, as well as the first Alaskan native to serve in Congress. She's also the perfect example of why Republicans, eh, they should be nervous about November. After pulling off a stunning and historic upset, defeating Republican Sarah Palin and Nick Begich in the state's special election, all three will be facing off again in November's midterms, this time for a full two-year term. And joining me now is Congresswoman-elect Mary Peltola of Alaska. Uh, now I can congratulate you on air, as I, I did get a chance to do uh, off air. Uh, it's exciting. You get sworn in tomorrow. What time? 6.30 Eastern Standard Time, 10.30 p.m. Alaska okay. time. That, that it is exciting. And I can imagine that, for, I did ask you, I, I will ask you again, have you picked out an outfit? I know this is completely shallow, but... Well, it is important because that seems to be what people talk about most. <laughs> um, but yes, I do have a dress that I have worn. I wore it to my son's boot camp graduation from the Coast Guard last September. It's nothing new, but it's yeah. comfortable. It's going to be a really long day. Yeah. So comfort is the key. I, I have to say, we were talking about Jossie Ross was on. You were his Who Won the Week um, the, the, when you after you won. And it is exciting, I think, for it. In, indigenous people um, who are the first people of this nation have so little representation um, in presence presidential administrations, there's one person, um, and in Congress. So you're going to be the first Alaskan native to actually represent your state. How is that feeling for you? Well, I'm very proud of my Yupik heritage, and, and it is noteworthy. And, you know, I think, you know, in, in response to your comment, I think there were hundreds of years of an effort to assimilate and erase uh, Native people. But um, we're tough. We're survivors. And I am also half white. My dad is from Nebraska. He's German-American. And so I carry that heritage with me as well, proudly. Yeah. And so I really want to emphasize, especially to Alaskans, that I'm here to represent all Alaskans, no matter what your ethnic background is. You, you sound a little bit like Barack Obama, but right? Because you're coming from these two different worlds and you're sort of merging them. You physically merge them in your own family, in your own life, and you're able to do that politically. We were talking a little bit about just the physical stamina you have to have to campaign in Alaska. You're going from island to island, flying from place to place. How strenuous was that campaign? Um, it, it's, it's, it's a huge state. Um, if you cut Alaska in half, Texas would be the third largest state in the nation. We're enormous. We have more coastline than the lower 48. Um, uh, we're, we're just really big. And, and my campaign manager even noticed he followed our campaign for a couple days on the road. And he said, this is like a presidential campaign because you wake up in one town and um, at night you're 900 miles away and you're yeah. in a completely different place and you can only get around by plane very yeah. often. So it's big. It's, it's, it's grueling. And representing that state means that you have to continue to do that. You yes. have to go. You want to represent and see all of these communities. We talked about the physical stamina that it's going to take to go through tomorrow. Let's talk about the mental and emotional stamina it's going to take to be in a body where 129 people voted to overturn the election. There are insurrectionists there um, that they're, they're are practicing the big lie every day, still lying about the election, still saying the president of the United States is not president. You beat Sarah Palin, who is a very divisive figure, a very ultra MAGA figure. But the fact that you defeated her, I think, signaled to some people that maybe there's an exhaustion with that. Do you think that there's an exhaustion with that? And what are you sort of bracing yourself for in dealing with this Congress? 
Well, I do think there's an appetite for folks who want to bring people together and focus on the commonality. We all want good houses and good schools for our kids and jobs that pay a livable wage and a healthy economy, healthy environment, um, social security. We all want those things. Um, I, and, and, and I am very sensitive about the way in which MAGA people feel disenfranchised, forgotten, um, left behind. I think so many of different segments of our population feel that way, and now Caucasians are feeling that way, and men are feeling that way. So I think that that really signals to us that across America, we have just got to do better at making sure that we're talking about how we're all in this together. Um, a rising tide lifts all boats. We have a very diverse population, but we have a common future, and we're all in this together. And one of the things I like to say is no American is my enemy. If you're an American, I want to work with you. You're my teammate. I, I did. You're very generous to say that because there are some groups who have suffered much more greatly, I think, uh, to be fair. And I think you, half of your heritage comes from that. And obviously, people of color have suffered much more. But the complaints on the other side largely get down to the fact that they didn't win an election, to be, to be honest. And I wonder what you make of building a political belief system around not accepting that sometimes you lose. You're, you're, you are now a politician. You are a politician. Sometimes you lose. And there is a, a core a refusal to accept that this one group of people can lose. Isn't that dangerous? Well, I just, I, for speaking for myself, I stay away from victim sounding mm -hmm. messaging. I try to stay away from messages of fear and hate. I think that those are very lazy emotions. I think that if we're going to get to a place where we're solving our problems, we need to set those to the side and really focus on the energy and the type of, you know, words and thoughts and energy and momentum that it takes to get to problem solving. And we can't start solving our problems unless we are not calling names, unless we are not impugning motives. Um, in order to sit down and, and really get somewhere and negotiate, you have to bring the temperature down and people have to not feel threatened. And I think that everybody needs to make sure that they can save face. Um, and, you know, you talk about one group um, having suffered more than another group. And I think that it's important in America that we're not trying to one up each other on our level of suffering. Every single being on this earth has a hard life. Why should I have an easy life? Everybody has a hard life. And yes, certain things have happened to different groups that, that other groups haven't had to face, but life is hard. I think that your uh, philosophy fits perfectly with uh, Michelle. When Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high, you obviously go high. Mary Peltola, Congresswoman elect, and tomorrow, Congresswoman Mary Peltola. We'll be watching. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really Joy. appreciate you. Thank you. All right, congratulations.